from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, market malaise. The S&P 500 and the tech-heavy Nasdaq 100 having their worst weekly run of declines for a decade, as U.S. job numbers reinforce the idea that the Fed is staying the course on rates. Plus, DoorDash shares get caught in the downdraft, selling off for another day, hitting an all-time low. This despite strong earnings that show customers still paying for takeaway as we move into our post-pandemic world. A conversation with DoorDash CEO Tony Hsu is coming up. And Meta's latest leap into the metaverse is a real-world store. We go behind the scenes at the company's first retail location ahead of its grand opening. All of that in a moment, but first, the brutal sell-off continues. This time, pandemic darlings leading the bloodletting. Peloton hitting a new low. Bloomberg's Ed Blood, though, here to walk us through the week that I'm sure a lot of investors, Ed, want to close the book on. Yeah, look, there was so much hope at certain points of Friday as well. The Nasdaq 100 at times pushing into positive territory, and we thought we might end on a high, but it just wasn't to be, right? Nasdaq 100 down 1.2% Friday. As you said, the fifth straight weekly decline for that and other major indices. And the story is there on the board, right? The yield on the U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury, which is the benchmark, up nice nine basis points. We're at 3.1% and above. We haven't seen those levels since the end of 2018. And even Bitcoin at one point. Actually, you see it coming back a little as we go into the weekend session at $36,000 $36, per token. It was caught up in this risk-off kind of sentiment that we had, pushing lower back towards $35,000 per token. But as I said, it's kind of chopping as we go into the weekend. Look at this terminal chart. It tells the story of where we're at. This is not just a snapshot in time. This is a sustained sell-off that we're seeing, particularly in higher multiple tech stocks. We're talking about software companies that are so sensitive to the rates narrative. Of course, earlier in the week, the Fed raising rates by 50 basis points. Fed Chair Powell saying that 50 basis points are on the table for future meetings, but we're also concerned about recession risk. Can the Fed bring inflation under control with a soft landing without bringing us into recession? You also talked about some of the names on the move. It's been a really fascinating day because at the top of the tree of the Nasdaq 100, Apple up three-tenths of a percent and traders telling Bloomberg on the trading desks that what could be going on here is that this was the only stock at times. I was talking about how in brief moments the Nasdaq 100 was in positive territory. Apple was doing a lot of the legwork with that. And so is Amazon, according to these traders. And then Amazon capitulated, gave way. Tesla, same kind of story. You were talking as well about Peloton and DoorDash. Both those stocks we're going to talk about a lot later in the show record lows, these kind of pandemic era dialings for different reasons. Peloton news that, according to sources, they're looking to sell a 20% stake. DoorDash worrying about this reopening and about the investments they'll have to make. Oh, and what a week. Right, a week indeed, Ed. Thank you. I want to stick with that volatility that continues to dominate the markets and bring in Mark Mahaney of Evercore. Mark, some of these companies actually had strong earnings results, but they're still getting caught up in this downdraft, you know, what's your take here? How are you reading through this? Well, okay, Emily, I'll, uh, I think my take on it would be the companies that actually had strong earnings actually did trade up, but there were very few of those companies in tech land. So let me try this. You know, you mentioned DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash, you know, is uh, the fundamentals got stronger, but they're not really yet putting up sustained gap earnings. And so uh, the market is not willing to uh, bid up stocks, despite what happens on the top line, if uh, they don't have a lot of bottom line cushion and they don't trade somewhat close to a market multiple. It's going to be a challenge for pure growth equities like DoorDash. I like DoorDash as a stock, but in this market, it's going to be challenged. Airbnb put up really good numbers earlier this week. Stock couldn't hold the gains. Uh, uh, Uber put up good numbers. Stock couldn't hold the gains. The one that could, though, was booking. Uh, and booking had positive results, but they also have a market multiple, a PE, you know, real earnings uh, uh, and they've had them for a long time, a bulletproof balance sheet, et cetera. So this market is very discriminating and it won't, it won't tolerate growth uh, assets right now. If you're a growth stock, you better have a good earnings uh, track record. In that case, the stock can trade up. I think that's kind of what's happening. People are just going to the defensive end of growth tech and the, usually there's not too many names in that space. 
Based on the actions the Fed is taking here, how concerned are you about a recession and just a, a prolonged market meltdown? Well, I, I don't know, Emily. I'm, I'm certainly no expert on that, but I can. All my inter my interpretation is simply that the market on Thursday and Friday said we don't believe the Fed can orchestrate a soft landing. That's how I interpret what happened. Uh, maybe the Fed can. Maybe the Fed can't. I'm no expert on that. I, I think the odd it, it, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. But that's what the market is saying. And, and in, as a, as an investor in tech stocks, you know, the one thing I have to worry about is if there really is a recession. That's not estimated in. It may be priced in, but it's not estimated in. Uh, almost all consumer tech is cyclical. So if the consumer, if they were going to enter in a recession, you know, Amazon on its earnings call said they hadn't seen any sign of consumer uh, softening. They had a lot of issues in terms of costs, but not in terms of demand. So things could get worse at Amazon. They could get worse at Google. They could get worse at Apple. None of these companies skate away from a real recession. So that's potentially the other shoe to drop here. That's what the market, the market's fearing that, it's pricing it in, and I hope the market's wrong, but, but that's the, until proven otherwise, I think that's what's going to hold back tech stocks and growth equities, you know, for the foreseeable future. I don't know if that's a couple of weeks, months, or hopefully it's not quarters, but it's that time of, that, that kind of time frame. We also might see, be seeing a changing of the guard in terms of what counts as a tech company. I spoke with Robert Cantwell of Upholdings portfolio yesterday he had this to say about netflix and meta take a listen netflix is now being valued like a cable station uh, other investors are looking at facebook's meta's uh, capital intensity and saying is this does their future look more like at t's than it does google and you've seen multiples re-rate faster than we've seen in a really long time across these assets because investors now in our opinion they've likely moved too far in that direction but, you know, we've got to do our jobs and parse through it and find the good deals here. Mark, saw you nodding there. Do you agree? I think there's a lot of really good points there. Look, you look at um, Netflix, uh, it's traded off 70% year to date. There's about five or six companies I looked at have traded off 70% year to date. Now with Netflix, because they hit a growth wall, this stock was priced as if, and I thought at the very beginning of the year, I thought they could sustain 20, 25 million subs, you know, going forward. So that's not the case. And that stock was trading at a high multiple. So we had to take out the premium that it had. Uh, and then you had the lower estimates. Uh, that's what got me off the uh, the Netflix train, you know, early this uh, early this year. But yeah, when companies go X high, uh, premium growth, they go X growth. You can have a real reckoning in terms of the stock price if they go X premium growth when they are sitting there with high multiples. That was absolutely the case with Netflix. Now I think there's a lot of very interesting valuation arguments that can be made about Netflix. You got thirteen dollars in pure gap earnings. What multiple do you want to put on that? A market multiple seventeen times, fifteen times, twenty times. We're in that ballpark. So now there's a lot of valuation support for the name. Facebook, I think, is different. And by the way, I really like Facebook here. I think the stock can re-rate. I think the multiple can go higher. I think this is going to recover to have being a premium growth name. But I understand it's very controversial here. I, I like it. And it's also got a lot of cash on the balance sheet. And you also, of course, cover Twitter, which has got its own story going on with this Elon Musk takeover. He's lined up this long list of unusual investors to back his bid to buy Twitter from Larry Ellison to a Saudi prince to the cryptocurrency firm Binance. He also was tweeting earlier today some more hints as to what he plans to do with Twitter. That'll be focusing on hardcore software engineering, design, information security, server hardware. What do you make of that? Well, I, I, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see his tweets earlier today, but if he's starting to develop a more detailed plan for what he wants to do with the asset, I think that's great. Um, you know, I think there's been a product innovation problem at Twitter for, I don't know, the better part of five, six, seven years. And so if somebody, if, if it takes a new management team, takes a new owner to shake it up and to really improve it, I think that's going to be great for all of us. I do worry one thing, which is all the money for Twitter comes really from marketers and advertisers. And I haven't heard anybody talk about how they're going to improve the tools for them because they're the ones who pay the bills at the end of the day. Yeah, I don't think you're going to make that much money if you try to charge a subscription for, uh, you know, for, for Twitter. So I hope he can improve t Twitter as a, as a service. As a user, I, I, think I, I want that. As an investor, I don't think there's much to do with Twitter here. I think this deal is going to go through. I think it's largely closed. Uh, but uh, but maybe we'll see it again in the public markets in a few years. That's what I heard that uh, he intends to do. If he can come out with a better asset, the market will be very interested in Twitter. All right. Well, always appreciate your insights here and helping us wrap a really painful week for a lot of investors. Mark Mahaney of Evercore. Thank you. Coming up, DoorDash shares jumped in pre-market trading but got pulled down with the rest of the market. People still paying up for food delivery as the pandemic wanes.
How much more growth is there ahead? We will ask CEO Tony Hsu. He joins me next. This is Bloomberg. The music is stopping for some pandemic darlings like Peloton and Netflix as people get back out into the world to live their lives. But it is still humming so far for DoorDash. Revenue beating analyst estimates and a strong outlook ahead with people still ordering more and more food for delivery. But how long does that keep up with inflation and a potential recession bearing down? I want to bring in DoorDash CEO Tony Hsu for more on all of this. And Tony, it's a tough market to be in now, despite your strong results, we saw uh, shares take a leg down. You know, what is your takeaway from how investors are evaluating these results? Well, I think it's certainly a, a, a tough market out there, as you acknowledge. But, you know, at the same time at DoorDash, we're focused on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals for DoorDash are incredibly strong. As you saw, you know, with this most recent quarter, we announced all-time highs in our um, monthly active users, our Dash Pass subscribers, as well as order frequency across cohorts. We're continuing to build into new categories beyond restaurants, into grocery, convenience, retail. We're launching more than just you know the United States as a global business, and we're also making tremendous progress on building our platform in which we're helping physical businesses become digital powerhouses. In addition to the local marketplace that we've been building, so in times like these, especially. Um, you know, what I tell our teams is to focus on, you know, the fundamentals and keep building the business. Investors seem to really be punishing or at least questioning growth stocks. And I know some are wondering, oh, was it because of Omicron that DoorDash saw this boost in the last quarter? Is that going to keep up quarter after quarter after quarter? How do you respond to that? Well, it's been two years now, or maybe a little over that, um, in during the pandemic season, and we've continued to see growth. I mean, our U.S. restaurants business has grown 250% over the last couple of years. We've gained 14 points of absolute share in the category. And I think what you've seen, whether it was you know early on in the pandemic, as certain states opened up maybe a little bit ahead of others, or now where everyone, thankfully, are finally getting back into their normal lives of seeing their friends and family in person, it's that people, you know, even though they can they they eat out and celebrate, they're continuing to order delivery. I mean, that's why you're seeing, you know, the all-time highs that we've seen in the business. In addition to that, we've also increased our profitability on top of an already profitable business um, altogether. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of strength in the business, both in terms of the demand, but also in terms of our bottom line. Consumers are under pressure, though. Inflation is rising. Gas prices are rising. These are factors beyond your control. How are you thinking about the macroeconomic environment ahead? I mean, are you just kind of preparing for more uncertainty? Well, we've been studying inflation pretty carefully now for the past four to six quarters because I think it happened actually, um, or, or, or the growth of inflation, I should say, you know, occurred maybe a, a bit sh more sharply than some had anticipated. And, and it certainly it continues to be a real concern. Um, so for us, the focus is on taking care of all the audiences. You know, obviously, we can't control the rate of change of inflation, but we can control um, you know, what we do for dashers, making sure that we're giving 10% cash back on fuel expenses, making sure that we are paying bonuses for longer distances driven, um, making sure that we're working with merchants um, to find even new ways to grow as they're dealing with both labor shortages as well as inflationary pressures. And we can do that because we have a robust restaurants business where consumer demand is still very resilient, which gives us the ability to reinvest those profits into absorbing any costs from inflation so that consumers don't have to bear any of that burden. We did see a number of analysts cut price targets on DoorDash this morning, and I wonder how tight the labor market is for you in particular. I mean, because it's not just, you know, restaurants that need labor. It's, it's DoorDash and Uber and Lyft and Domino's Pizza that are fighting for, for drivers. Well, we, uh, you know, uh, we haven't actually seen any challenges in getting drivers on the road. In fact, even before the you know recent rises in fuel expenses or the sharp uptick, I should say, in fuel expenses, we had plenty of drivers on the road. And that's because structurally, we have a pool of drivers 
that that is just much larger than other services like ride sharing. Um, you know, 90% of the dashers on DoorDash of the 3 million plus that come to our platform and 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 does deliveries on a quarterly basis, 90% of them deliver more fewer than 10 hours a week. The average dasher only completes about four hours of work every week. And, and so when you think about it from that context where it's truly part-time and supplemental income, and you compare it to something like ride sharing, which is more full-time, it's just orders of magnitude larger in terms of the base of drivers we can um, address. And, and for those reasons, we actually haven't seen any of those pressures of getting drivers on the road. But that said, we do recognize that inflation is very real, and that's why we decided to invest in those Dasher programs to make sure that their earnings would not be impacted. Interesting. Well, uh, on one hand, you're hearing Lyft say they're going to have to invest significantly to incentivize drivers. Uber saying they don't have to, but they are making some changes to the app, more transparency to keep those drivers coming back. And I wonder, are you going to prioritize the courier app experience and how if your competitors are trying to step up those levers? Well, we don't really compete against ride sharing for drivers. I mean, 96% of drivers that we've surveyed, you know, on the DoorDash platform have no interest in, um, you know, driving other people. Um, they just prefer to do deliveries. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, the two user bases couldn't be, you know, further apart in terms of how they self-select which platforms to work on. Um, if, but you what know, about Uber who, Eats? What about Instacart? Yeah, what about, but, you know, Domino's? Sure, 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 sure. I mean, as the largest platform um, in the U.S. that you know provides more work opportunities on a daily basis across more geographies, um, we're just the first consideration for most of these workers. I mean, we're always going to, you know, your question about investing in the, the, the Dasher app, of course, we're always investing, you know, behind that experience to make sure that it's lower friction um, to earn whenever you want, wherever you want, and to do it, you know, with consistent expectations of what you will earn when you are on the road because the work is so part-time. Investors are also suggesting we're going to see a lot more consolidation in this space. And given that DoorDash is the big player in this market that makes you potentially a, a prime acquirer. We saw you buy Volt, for example. Are we going to see you do more deals? Are you looking for more deals? And if so, in what areas? Well, the bar for M&A is, is very high for us at DoorDash. And that's because we really respect how difficult it is to actually do it really well. Um, so for us, two things have to be true. Number one, it certainly has to be accretive to the business. Number two, it also has to be accretive to the management bandwidth that we have at DoorDash. I mean, we're trying to build the largest local commerce business globally. So we have a lot of work on our plate. So we have to make sure that there can't be any distractions and that's entirely focused. That's why, you know, Volt was such a perfect example. You know, Volt certainly adds to our international global footprint, doubling almost our addressable market. But the way in which they build their business, the culture around building the best product, making sure that they do it in a capital efficient way, that aligns very well with how we do things at DoorDash. And that was a perfect example of when M&A made sense. All right, well, we'll be watching your next moves there. DoorDash CEO and co-founder Tony Hsu, always good to have you. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Emily. Coming up. A trip to the metaverse in real world retail. We've got a sneak peek at Meta's first brick and mortar store. We'll tell you if it's worth a visit. Next, this is Bloomberg. Monday is opening day for Meta's first ever physical store. It is a brick and mortar bet on the metaverse. Facebook's parent, Hoping Hardware, plays a central role in its virtual and augmented reality strategy. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow got a behind the scenes look at the store in Burlingame, California. If you needed any more proof that Meta is going all in on Web3, then look no further. Come take a look inside the company's first retail store, where VR and AR hardware are at the forefront as the company charges into the metaverse. Yes, this is a metaverse store in the real world. This store is the size of a small house. 
less than 1,600 square feet. Opening it is a pretty gutsy move for Meta, considering other tech giants have tried and failed. In 2020, Microsoft shut down its store locations permanently to focus on online sales. And earlier this year, Amazon announced it was closing its physical bookstores, Amazon four-star locations, and mall pop-up kiosks so that the company could better focus on its grocery business. So why does Meta think it will be more successful than its peers? Well, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said, quote, the best way to understand virtual reality is to experience it. And he believes that the metaverse is the next major computing revolution after the invention of cell phones. Here we have Meta's virtual reality goggles, the Quest 2, which sell for about $299. This is the Ray-Ban stories. Hold tap for a photo. Single tap, start filming. Double tap, you get some music going. Volume up. Volume down. Meta wants this store to be a bridge that connects users to the metaverse, but that means that it has to rely on users actually being interested in the metaverse. That might not be so hard. In 2021, out of the 11.2 million AR and VR units sold worldwide, 78% were Meta's Quest 2. So Meta does have a large market share, but can it keep up the momentum? And will stores like this one help the company expand its metaverse footprint? Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow there. The store opens next week. And here are some other stories we are following. Peloton still trying to turn its business around. According to Bloomberg sources, the fitness company trying to sell a stake of about 20%, hoping to find a big name corporation or a private equity firm that could help validate the business with its investment. Peloton has been contacting potential buyers, but the process is still at an early stage. Palantir, meantime, just struck a 10 million pound contract. That's $12.5 million with the UK's Ministry of Defense. The data analytics company will offer support with its Foundry platform, which lets users cut costs by automating work and reducing data processing time. This is the firm's largest contract to date with the high profile department. And coming up, Spencer Raskoff, longtime investor and co-founder of Zillow, joins me next. His thoughts on the market meltdown and what it means for the housing market next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the markets and our Ed Ludlow. Ed, there are two sectors of right. the market you think tie up some of these big themes we're seeing this week in tech. Do yeah. tell. Yeah, e-commerce and then houses. Bear with me. E-commerce first, right? You look at the names on the board. Shopify down almost 9% again Friday. That's after it had a really rough Thursday. Etsy down 5%. Both of their, those stocks at their lowest level since mid-2020. The narrative is that there's a big e-commerce slowdown. We're trying to navigate this transition to the post-pandemic world. These were pandemic darlings where people are increasingly going to physical stores. They had earnings. Earnings have the market concern. Now, let's bring up this chart in the Bloomberg and, and just extrapolate out right to where we are year to date. E-commerce is not doing great, right? This is a percentage year-to-date losses. You know, Amazon, think about last week, about the sort of sharp reaction we saw to Amazon and the concern there. Well, some of these names, Shopify, Wayfair, Etsy, their declines are even worse year-to-date. 50, 60, 70%. A lot of concern there. And with inflation where it is, higher rates, the outlook for the economy, concerns about recession, where do we go from there? Now... Let's think about housing and Zillow. Zillow's really interesting to me because this is a company that has a lens because of its platform into leads, right? You go to Zillow, I do it all the time to see where am I gonna live hypothetically. But they also have a great outlook or actually not such a great outlook in terms of EBITDA for the spring quarter. A little softer than the market was expecting. You can 
well, I mean, the chart says it all right, the reaction to their earnings report. We were down 13% at one point on Friday's session. We paired those losses to close down about 4%. But with the outlook for higher rates and the Fed, the pass through to mortgage rates, should we keep an eye on this tech company as a kind of lens for the economy? What about housing supply? These are all really good questions. And I think there's somebody you could ask about that. Indeed, Ed Ludlow, thank you. Let's stay on Zillow and welcome back Spencer Raskoff, one of Zillow's co-founders who ran the company for more than a decade. He is also the co-founder of 75 and Sunny, a venture firm based in LA. So I want your view, Spencer, on the big market picture, but let's start with the housing market and how all of these trends, rising inflation, rising rates for the foreseeable future, how that's gonna bear down on the housing market. Well, what's driving home price appreciation is limited supply. So for most decades, starting in the 60s, we had 20 million new homes be built. In the decade after the financial crisis of 2008, we only had 10 million homes that were built. And so there's just a lot of missing supply. And that's what's driven this huge uh, uptick in home price appreciation over the last five or so years. So as mortgage rates have gone up, and, and they're gonna, they still have further to go, Clearly, home buyers are going to have to trade down to slightly lower price points. But most of the data that I've seen around housing still predicts strong housing appreciation, not as high as it was, not uh, 10 to 20 percent, but probably 5 to 10 percent home price appreciation. Now, the stocks that underlie this, like Zillow, that's a bit of a, a whole other question. And there's obviously been a risk off trade in the public markets away from growth and more towards profitability. And that's hurting companies like Zillow and many other prop tech companies as well. So I just want to linger on this because there's a lot of people trying to get into the market who think they just can't uh, right now. If they didn't buy something first 10 years ago, you're saying prices are still going to go up they and are. there's still a lack of supply. So there's still going to be competition, even though we're, we're seeing 40 year inflation and rates going up and people's portfolios are getting pummeled. We're still only at about one to two month supply of housing which is amazing. I mean, a normal market would have six months supply of homes for sale. So homes, there's just are not enough homes for sale. We need home builders to build more homes if you want this supply demand imbalance to, to come back uh, uh, you know, into balance. So if, if you, home prices are still going to keep going up in most major markets, not as quickly as they were, but home prices are in fact still appreciating. So let's talk about the sell-off. How much worse does it get? Has a bubble popped? Is this, you know, what we're going to see for, you know, the next several years? Well, it's a bit of a bloodbath out there. Obviously, public market investors and, and viewers can see in the public markets just how bad it is in among public companies. I can give you a little insight into what's happening in the private markets. And unfortunately, it's pretty ugly there as well. So the closer you are to being public, the harder a go of it one will have. So companies that were already in the IPO window hoping to go public this year, that window is shut. S1s are being pulled. Those companies are not getting public anytime soon. Late stage growth companies are pulling back. Early stage companies are not getting rounds done. I mean, there's a, a real venture chill uh, afoot, unfortunately. And I'm seeing companies across all of the private sector, all of the uh, venture funded companies that I'm involved in are pulling back in different ways. So many of them are tightening headcount. Many of them are cutting marketing. Most of them are hunkering down. Some of them are doing inside rounds because they, they can't raise outside rounds from new investors. So it's amazing how quickly the weather has turned. In just really a couple months, we've gone from uh, an incredibly ebullient market to one that's extremely challenged. So how long are they going to hunker down for? How long are they going to have to be hiding? <laughs> well, I, I had one investment banker tell me the other day that uh, if you look back over the last 20 years, the IPO window has only ever been closed for about six months, and we're already in month four of closure. So that bodes well for a reopening of the IPO market sometime later this year. But private companies, venture funded companies, they're just assuming that this year is kind of a write off. I mean, every company I'm involved in, I've, I've said you should assume you should operate your business assuming you'll not be able to raise a venture round this year. That's how hmm. that's how conservative at least at least my companies are being. So I think this could last for for quite a while. It's this risk off trade as interest rates ticked up. Public market and private market investors are prioritizing profitability over growth, and that's increased the cost of capital. It's made it difficult for high growth companies to raise money, and they're all pulling back as a result. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news on a Friday afternoon. Hmm. Well, uh, giving it to us straight, we appreciate it. There is one person out there who seems to have no trouble raising money, and that is Elon Musk, 
who has lined up a long list of investors to help him take over Twitter. He was tweeting earlier some of his ideas, uh, more ideas for how he plans to change the company. Those, there's still a lot of unknowns. You're a big, prolific tweeter. What do you think about Elon Musk owning this company? Well, I was surprised, to be honest, and I tweeted as such. I was surprised that this deal got done, although it actually hasn't gotten done yet, so, so we'll see. But um, as a Twitter user, I'm sort of excited to see what Elon's product insights are going to bring to the product, the product that I've used for so long and so many of us love. So it should be interesting to watch. Um, uh, I am a little surprised that he's gotten so much financing lined up, given that he has publicly stated that he's not going to try to run this like a normal business. He's not trying to maximize profit. He doesn't. He's not even really interested in a financial return, and yet he has still convinced others to invest alongside him. This just goes to show how much uh, amazing magic and pixie dust Elon Musk has uh, you know, associated with him that he's able to get people to co-invest, even when he says it's an unconventional investment. Um, you know, I, I I do worry as a Twitter user that the company has made great strides to reduce spam, reduce bullying, and. A lot of the discussion about how we're going to restore free speech to, with Twitter on Twitter, it sounds really good, but with free speech comes a lot of spam, a lot of harassment, and a lot of bullying. And those are things that Twitter management has worked very hard to reduce over the last couple of years. So I worry about a possible step back in that, in that regard. But benefit of the doubt has to go to one of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time uh, who's created so many extraordinary companies. And obviously, he uses the product as much as anybody. So it'll be amazing to watch. There'll be plenty for, for you to talk about and for me to tweet about as, as Elon takes this company what, private. What, what do you think about the role of Jack Dorsey here and, and the, the future of a decentralized Twitter? Is that a good idea? I'm not really sure what that means, to be perfectly candid. Um, I, I mean, I, I, there's talk about open sourcing the algorithm and providing more transparency, but I, I don't really know what that means to the user, and I don't know how it affects the business model. Um, you know, th this company has always had, it's always been a little dysfunctional, right? At, at the board level, at the management level, it's always had challenges. It's always punched above its weight in terms of, of media attention and consumer interest. And so, you know, maybe out of the public eye, maybe private for a couple of years, it'll be able to stabilize its leadership team, stabilize its board, focus on the product, and then hopefully come back out the other side, an improved company and, and hopefully an improved product. All right. Spencer Raskoff, always appreciate your thoughts here on the show, co-founder of Zillow and 75 and Sunny, such a great name for a venture firm. Given today's weather, thank you. Coming up, we will wrap the week in crypto markets. How crypto is being taken down with the broader sell-off next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our crypto report and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies taking a beating along with the rest of tech in this sell-off. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld here with the big picture. Katie, what a week. What a week. It was an especially bad week for risk assets, an especially bad week for Bitcoin in particular. It actually didn't start out so bad. We actually rallied on Tuesday, but you add in Thursday's nearly 9% drop. And Bitcoin set to end the week with losses of nearly 6%. Uh, it's trading at about $36,000 right now, about a hair below. At one point, it hit $40,000 this week. That is a distant memory at this point, uh, Emily. But a big reason why we saw Bitcoin perform so poorly is because it really trades like a tech stock more than anything else. Bitcoin's 90-day correlation with the Nasdaq 100, it's currently at its strongest level in data going back to at least 2010, which really tells you something. And as, you, as you can see in that chart there, that relationship has really strengthened in the past couple of months, in the past couple of weeks even. And now you have tech stocks really under pressure from rising rates.
Bitcoin is too. And what's interesting in this sell-off, this tech sell-off, this crypto sell-off, you have Ether. It's been a relative haven. Still down for the week about 4.5%, but obviously less than Bitcoin. And that's interesting because Bitcoin is billed as digital gold. It's clearly not acting as a haven lately, though. And as you can see, Bitcoin, or Ether rather, it's outperformed not just this week, but over the past few years at this point, Emily. You're not safe anywhere. Are you? Uh, no. I want to ask you about another story, and that is NVIDIA agreeing to pay a $5.5 million fine as part of a settlement with the SEC over crypto mining. What do we know about this? This is fascinating. So it basically boils down to NVIDIA allegations that NVIDIA failed to adequately disclose just how much of its revenue comes from demand from crypto miners. So the SEC said that for two consecutive quarters in 2018, NVIDIA didn't make clear that demand from crypto miners in particular made up a significant part of its sales increase for graphics processing units. NVIDIA, of course, settled that case. They didn't admit wrongdoing, but they did pay that $5.5 million fine. And this is fascinating, Emily, because if you think about Ethereum, it's moving away from proof of work mining to proof of stake. And what that really means is that it's no no longer going to require those graphics cards. It's much less intensive. And already in December, NVIDIA had warned that it's seen revenue from crypto mining drop by over 75% compared to the previous few quarters. And Ethereum hasn't even moved to this proof of stake mining process yet. That's still yet to come further this year, but already NVIDIA under pressure. It really reminded me of the conversation we had yesterday about how these movements in the crypto market, they affect the equities of stocks and the companies that are involved just broadly in the crypto sphere. So Katie, what are you going to be watching when the markets open next week? And of course, crypto trades through the weekend. It's a great question. Honestly, I'm most interesting, interested in this dynamic between Ethereum and Bitcoin. Again, Bitcoin, it's the largest cryptocurrency out there. It's supposed to be the most liquid, the most stable, this haven. Ethereum clearly giving it a run for its money. We'll see if this outperformance can continue both on the upside and the downside. All right. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld, thank you for wrapping all that up for us. Coming up, Twilio CEO Jeff Lawson joining us next. We're going to talk about earnings and how all this market volatility could impact Twilio and his view on the road ahead. That's next. This is Bloomberg. We saw tech stocks fall for the fifth straight week, marking the sector's worst weekly streak since 2012. I'm joined now by Twilio CEO Jeff Lawson. The company just reported its earnings results and better than expected, but still they couldn't escape the sell-off either. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. So let's put Twilio aside for the moment. I, I really want to get your view on the broader picture of what's happening in the markets here. Inflation, macroeconomic certain uncertainty, rising rates. How are you reading all of this? Well, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, we're seeing the end of a long era of free money that our economy and the global economy has been in, you know, going back all the way to September 11th and then refreshed again during the financial crisis and then with COVID. And so, uh, you know, investors are obviously reacting to and the whole world's reacting to and the government's reacting to, you know, what the implications of that are to, to now for the really almost the first time in 20 years, like managing inflation versus interest rates. And so, yep, uh, a lot of reset going on. You know, we're not happy about obviously what's been happening with tech stocks or our stock, uh, but at the same time, you know, new world that, that we're entering. And I just think about the fundamental value proposition that Toyo provides, you know, to our customers. Uh, and we're now a th in three and a half billion dollar revenue run rate business uh, growing incredibly fast. And so, yeah, we just keep our eye on the ball, which is serving our customers. And I think that's what a lot of companies are, are probably just doing during this time. You say you're planning to deliver 30 percent, more than 30 percent organic growth over the next couple of years. Does that still happen? if we go into a recession? Well, we just reconfirmed uh, our guidance that uh, we are going to deliver 30% annual organic growth through 2024. And we started that guidance um, 
uh, in 2020. Uh, and so we have yet again reconfirmed it, as well as uh, last quarter, we added that we intend to be profitable for the fiscal year for 2023. 20, uh, and uh, and so we just reconfirmed both of those. Now, now look, if the, the whole you know, world hits uh, some, you know, the worst case scenario of uh, a macro environment, you know, who knows what could happen in that world. But from every indicator that we see today, that, that gave us reason to reconfirm both of those points of guidance on our call this week. So talk to us more about how things like messaging and other new features are evolving. So you keep those customers, new customers signing up and sales coming in. Yeah, we have uh, almost 270,000 companies that use Twilio to engage with their customers. And when you think about what's been happening in the long trend of you know, the last 20 years of digital transformation, more and more companies, businesses are moving online and they're seeing more and more digital transactions. That means they meet their customers in this digital world. And we provide the tools and the communications channels, now the data infrastructure, to allow companies to know their customers based on all the data that they see about their customers, first party data, and then take that understanding of their customer and use it to engage with those customers. And engagement is essentially the act of, of personalizing all of your interactions, making every interaction relevant. It's the act of actually buying relevant ads to target your customers. It's the act of having a direct channel of conversation with your customer. And companies who do this well see outsized performance in their revenue. In fact, we recently did a survey of 3,000 different uh, executives at a wide variety of companies all around the globe. And we found that those companies that invested in customer engagement, which is building that digital relationship with their customers, on average saw 70% revenue growth last year. And so that just goes to show you that when you build a strong relationship with your customer using all this amazing technology that is out there that Twilio powers, well, it has outsized returns in terms of revenue. Now, I want to ask you about a slightly different topic and the leak of the draft opinion from the Supreme Court on Roe versus Wade. Uh, Twilio came out last year opposing the Texas anti-abortion law. And I'm, I'm just curious for your reaction to this leak, what you're telling employees. Well, you know, I think it is, uh, it is a dark day to re be removing fundamental rights from basically half of our population. And we think it is uh, a woman's right uh, to choose her health care decisions for her body. We're going to support our employees uh, in their need to, to get the health care options that they need. And uh, ultimately, we think that uh, health care is a personal choice, and that should be a choice that's left up to the individual. And how do you think about this as a business leader? Because there certainly are customers who don't necessarily agree with you. Absolutely. Uh, it's a very tough issue, and it is, a, it is an issue that science has not answered the question of, like, when does life begin? And so, therefore, it becomes a matter of beliefs, and there are religious beliefs, personal beliefs, et cetera, involved in this decision, which makes it a very hard issue for leaders um, like myself or any to, to actually kind of, you know, opine on. And so, in some ways, it's like, <laughs> stop asking me a man <laughs> just because I'm a CEO what I think about it like what I what I ultimately can say is I believe that women should have the choice to 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 make decisions healthcare decisions about their own bodies and you know and that's not an opinion of when life begins and all that science doesn't know the answer nobody knows the answer to that but what I do believe is that women should have the ability to make those decisions for themselves Fair enough. I want to ask you about another hard issue, and that is of free speech. You, in the past, for example, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, you called on social media to do a better job, cracking down on hate and misinformation. What do you think about Twitter uh, being owned by Elon Musk, given that his big thing is quote-unquote free speech? Well, I do think that reality, like free speech in a broad sense is a nice thing to rally around, but then you do run into reality, which is that when people say things or do things that violate the community standards, and every community has standards, online, offline, you name it, um, what are you going to do? And that is business consequences, like if users stop liking the community of, of, of a social media network, they'll stop using it. That is very real business impacts. And so the way I've thought about, you know, free speech, by the way, free speech is a legal doctrine that governs the government's um, uh, imposition of things you can say or can't say. It has nothing to do with what private companies um, actually, how they drive their terms of service and how a company builds its community. And so the very real business question will be is if some of those engagement, uh, if some of those rules get loosened or, you know, there is more community breaking type behavior on Twitter, 
people should vote with their feet. And look, you can go to the metaverse, you can go to the muskyverse, you can go to the snappyverse, you can go to the instaverse, whatever. Like there's a lot of options out there. Um, and so, and people can and will vote with how they use the service. And ultimately it's a business. And uh, that is probably going to drive a lot of the decisions okay. that, uh, that, that owners will make. That was quite an epic way to end this show on a Friday afternoon. Jeff Lawson, thank you for wading through some very thorny issues with the CEO of Twilio. Always good to have you on the show. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology Wall Street Week with my colleague David Weston is coming up next. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. We'll see you next week. This is Bloomberg.